Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I wish you a very blessed service of worship as we come together on this day the Lord has made. Uh, I just I, I highlight this about every year and a half to two years or so. Um, you know, the first page in our maroon hymnal has a series of prayers. You know, before worship, before communing. Um, you know, and, and just so you know that you know they're they're a good reference for us to bring us into. You know the place that we need to be um, you know so just kind of keep that in mind I know I actually do see it a few people reading that prayer before we I come out here and everything like that but uh, blessings to you as we come together we will use our blue hymnals today and open with 569 God of grace and God of glory <laughs> Shouts of joy, all people, sing to the glory of his name. Offer him glorious praise. Come and listen, all who honor God, and I will tell you what he has done. 
for me. I cried to him for help. I praised him with songs. If I had ignored my sin, the Lord would not have listened to my prayer. I praise God. If anyone sins, we have someone who pleads with the Father on our behalf, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. And Christ himself is the means by which one's sins are forgiven, not only our sin, but also the sins of everyone. Let us confess our sin before God and each other. Merciful God, we confess that we have often failed to be an obedient people. We can say in full agreement with what St. Paul says in Romans 7, For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Our tongue says things it should not. Our brains ponder things it should not. And at times it's just easier to walk past the person we know needs help. Heavenly Father, please forgive us. Amen. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, <clears throat> that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, so that free from sin we might live for righteousness. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Since God has forgiven you in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen and amen. satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. 
When goods increase, they increase to eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in must vexation, and sickness, and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life, that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them, and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. For he will, <clears throat> will not much remember the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. <coughs> <clears throat> you know, maybe to pick up a New Testament talk here from Paul's letter to Timothy, uh, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, didn't, it, some, this is one of the most oft misquoted verses in the Bible. A lot of times we hear the love of money is the root of all evil. That is, that is not the case. Um, it's, the, it's the root of all kinds of evil. And in, we, as we read this, one of the most common false gods in the world is the love of money. And, you know, as we get to the end of this, we read about people who have the proper perspective. God first. That, that, that is always, and that Solomon is telling us, God first. <laughs> <coughs> and just kind of keep that in your heart and mind and be lifted up in that faith. Our second reading will serve as our sermon text from Hebrews chapter 4, 1 to 13. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his words were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he says, they shall not enter my rest. Since, therefore, it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day. Today. Saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Forever, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joint and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. This is our crystal reading. We rise for the Holy Gospel. Our 
Holy Gospel comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 23 to 31. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. But the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you, Jesus said. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or mother or father or children or land for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, a hundred now in this time, houses and brothers, sisters and mothers and children and land with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So you can see the relationship between the, this love of money between our Old Testament reading and our Gospel reading here. Um, but all things are possible with God. You know, and we, are thank, we thank and praise our Lord for that truth. May you be lifted up in it. You may be seated and we continue with 7 to 6. We praise you, O oh God. Hebrews chapter 4 today, therefore. And the word therefore means, okay, you better pay close attention to what I just said. And to be honest with you, you know, we don't always remember what was the epistle reading last week. Um, 
you know, and I'm up here reading them, and I, I have to say, okay, what did I read last week? But, but so I, I look back too. And you know, one of the things we need to hear is that this is written to Hebrews, and you know, when I read the epistle, you know, I or you know, in the weeks gone by from Hebrews, you know, I said the word Hebrew is a, a reference to God's chosen people in the Old Testament. They were Hebrews. Abraham was really the Hebrew, uh, the wandering Aramean, so to speak. But um, then, you know, two generations down came Jacob, um, and Jacob um, had his name changed to Israel. So they became the Israelites. Jacob had a son named Judah, and after Assyria destroyed the ten northern tribes, they became Jews. And so, it, But it's a reference to God's Old Testament chosen people. And so the writer to the Hebrews is writing to a group of Jews, we might say Messianic Jews, because they believe Jesus is the Messiah. And he's writing to them to build them up in the faith and the need that they have for the faith and the blessing of what this faith gives to them. And, you know, so it's therefore... Um, and he's reminding them of a point in Israel's history where the people had every reason in the world to believe, but they lacked faith. And I'll, I'll, I'll read the text here in a minute, but I want you to hear. As a pastor, I hear quite often statements similar to this. I wish I could have seen what the Old Testament Jews saw. If I saw what they saw, I would never, ever, ever doubt. You know, and when, so you think about that. And so, so what did they see? Well, we can look at it, you know, from this perspective. And this is what's referred to in chapter 3 a little bit here. Is that in the Old Testament, these Israelites, these Hebrews, these Jews... They saw God bring a nation out of slavery in Egypt. I mean, they were slaves for over 400 years. Egypt was a nation with an army uncomparable in the world. Chariots, archers, spears. Uh, you know, nobody would even challenge them. They were so powerful. And the Israelites are slaves, and God brings them out with a powerful hand, the scripture says. He uses, it. He uses quote unquote, ten plagues, you know, water turning to blood, frogs, gnats, fleas, flies, uh, darkness, uh, hailstorms, you know, but all these things are bringing Egypt to their knees. And the, Pharaoh, who's you know in control of everything, his 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 advisors are starting to say, Pharaoh, do not fight Israel's God. Well, Eric, Pharaoh kept on hardening his heart, and finally the Passover, where God passed over and all the oldest children of the Egyptians was killed, including Pharaoh. <clears throat> And finally, Pharaoh said, go. Get out of here. In fact, I want you out of here so bad, here's a bunch of gold and silver and everything else. They, they left with wealth. And then they saw the parting of the waters. And they walked through, and Egypt's army followed, and God drowned them. And then God fed them for almost 40 years in the wilderness with manna and quail. Now, they saw all of this. Now, they're being tested in their faith. It's, you know, entering into the promised land, the land of Canaan, the future land of Israel, and they sent in 12 spies, and the spies went in and said, 
This land is everything God said it would be. <clears throat> a land filled with milk and honey, which means <clears throat> there's lots of food, fresh fruit, vegetables, meat, and everything else. It's a great land, but you know, all the cities are fortified, and all the big cities are fortified, and there's some people there that are giants. And they suddenly lack faith that God could give them the victory. The people who just saw God defeat Egypt lacked faith, and they failed to enter the rest that God had promised them, which means going into the promised land. They failed. And so today as we sit here, we are called to have faith in that same God, in the victory that he gives to us, the victory over sin, death, and Satan. In our opening hymn, we said, grant us wisdom, grant, I don't like to sing in front of you, but, uh, <clears throat> so we ask God, give me wisdom to recognize your truth to recognize Satan's temptations, and then give me a strength to say no to Satan's temptations and to say yes to God. And when he calls you today, reaffirm that faith. So we hear our text. Therefore, while the promise of entering of his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed entered that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his words works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from his works. And again in this passage he says, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is, a living, and, is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight. But all are naked and exposed to the eye of him to whom we must give account. This is our text. So as we hear this, you know, there's this, there's this remember when this happened. Now, true, as Christians living 2,000 years ago, the event I talked about in the wilderness might not be a part of your history, but yet it is a part of your history in this sense of the word. You are a person of God. You are people of God. And so it's a part of your history. And we see the consequence of not believing. Believing God's word is utmost for, our, for each and every one of us. Um, and we need to hear that word today and tomorrow, today. To hear that word, to, to be lifted up um, and to have that, 
peace that passes all understanding because of everything that God has done. A couple times in this text, the writer refers to the good news. The good news. What is the good news? Now you might have a different way of saying it for yourself in that literally the word gospel means good news. So the good news is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Crucified, died, and rose again. The good news is the gospel and that it tells us exactly what Jesus did for us. The good news is the gospel to give you the assurance of sins forgiven and the free gift of everlasting life in heaven. That is the good news, so to speak. You know, and when somebody asks you about the hope you have, you know, I'm not sure what your answer will be. But in a little bit, we're going to confess our Christian faith. And just think of the creeds as good news. In the beginning, God created gave us an absolutely beautiful world. That's good news. And then he moves into this, the second article, so to speak, and it's the good news of Jesus. Then we start off with Jesus in heaven, and in his great love for you, for me, for the world, he comes down as a babe in Bethlehem's manger. He's, he's crucified, died, buried, for your sin. And then he goes back up into heaven. This is all part to prepare a place for you. That's good news. It's something we hear every Sunday. You know, even when I have, and I do have bad sermons, you will still hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Because you say the creed every week. It is the gospel. The good news you hear be lifted up in it and go forward in it. And so now as we hear the good news and believe the good news, we live in the kingdom of grace and we have peace. We have rest. That no matter what, when I die, I get to go to heaven with Christ and enter into that kingdom of glory. And as we move along in our text, it says, let us strive. You know, Persevere. You know, grant us wisdom. Grant us courage for the facing of that time. You know, we strive to be with Christ here on earth and with Him for an eternity. And it talks about then, in starting in verse twelve, there, the Word of God. You know, the Word of God is you know how we are fed, strengthened, lifted up. You know, the Word of God is divided oftentimes in Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus being the division. Everything before Jesus is Old Testament. Everything after Jesus is New Testament. Old Testament, you believe that God is sending a Messiah. New Testament, Jesus is that Messiah. But another way to understand the Word of God is law and gospel. Law in the Old Testament, gospel in the Old Testament. Law in the New Testament, gospel in the New Testament. The law. You'll get this in confirmation here soon. But, uh, you know, the law is, number one, shows our sin. SOS. Just SOS. We think SOS save our ship, but it shows our sin. Tells us what is right and wrong. And that is what we bring to the Lord in confession. But it also shows us how to please God. The gospel, SOS, shows our Savior, shows us Jesus, tells us what God has done for us, and gives you that good news. But we need to remember something that is very essential. The Word of God has a power to reach into your heart, mine, my heart, and mine. And be lifted up in it. I want to read to you from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 and 11. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without 
watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So my word goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I send it. You know, the word of God has God behind it. The Holy Bible has God behind it. It's a double-edged sword, law, gospel. And I know most of you have heard me tell this story because it's one of those power stories about the word of God that, you know, is very personal to me because I was there when I saw it. But I used to work at Lutheran Valley Retreat. I worked there for five summers, and every summer we had a home for adults with a special need that would come to the camp and we would do outdoor activities with them. And we would take hikes, give them hay rides, and you know, and think, depending upon their ability, we would do different things with them. And on one night, and, and I love these guys, you know, but there was one person there by the name of Lester who might be the most powerful witness to me of all times that I've had. Lester was you know, very low functioning and he would walk up to a tree and he would say, man. He would walk up to a woman and say, man. He would walk into, walk up to the door and say, man. You know, and I, I, I knew this guy for three years, for three weeks, for three different years. And the only word I ever heard come out of his mouth was the word man. So one night, one of our staff members was giving a devotion. And, you know, as a devotion, you talk about Jesus. And so he asked Lester, who is Jesus? And I said, okay. Yeah, Jesus is true man. Don't ask somebody else about the true God part. And so he, he said, Lester, who is Jesus? And I expected Lester to say, man. And Lester, as clear as a bell, said, he is my Lord and Savior who died on the cross to pay for my sin. <laughs> the word of God reached into his heart and mind like nothing else. It is my prayer that as you, as the writer says here, therefore strive to enter that rest, that you be in the Word of God. That the Word of God would reach into your heart and mind and lift you up in the good news of Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and victorious over sin, death, and Satan for you. May you know as Lester did, he is your Lord and Savior, that you will enter into his rest and have that peace that passes all understanding while you live on this earth, but also for an eternity with him in heaven. Go in peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue by singing hymn 695 as we gather at your table. <coughs>
and I sing through today, hear that gospel, that good news that God has given to you and to me. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us in the last hour. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to the actual living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the cross. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge my baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we pray that you would lift us up in our faith. We may have those moments of struggle and everything else, and may we cry out, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief, and be lifted up. May your Holy Spirit instill in our hearts and minds that confidence, that peace, that joy, today, tomorrow, and always. We also come before you, Heavenly Father, and pray you would be with the people of the Southeast, uh, you know, the flooding, the hurricanes, and their recovery. Bless them, lift them up with the a, a faith and a wisdom and a courage that only you can give. Watch over this whole process. We come before you and pray you would bless these named individuals. We remember Dick Ramos, Dorothy Mitchell, Elaine Rungi, Elvira Graham, Beth Gaynor, Carl and Barb Thorson, Diane Miller, Lily Romito, Jim Jordan, Ted Lynn, Jeannie Rodriguez, Debbie Correo, Lori Cook, Cody Stolliker, Ivan Stolliker, Aubrey Eli, Jeannie Grasser, Vanessa Warden, Fred Waller, Harvey Billington, Laura Billington, John Baker, Riley Cure, Becky Reisig, Vicki Williamson, Ashley Franz, Kaylin Franz, Arlen Tanner, D. Ray Taylor, Charlie Wallstrom, Sharon Einspar, Rex Solly, Bonnie Willis, Taya Flock, and Dan Easley. We also pray that you would instill a godly wisdom in our leaders, into us as heads of families and everything else, that we have that wisdom that leads and guides us. We remember our military men and women. We name Kellen Day, Mitchell Mines, Andrew Burton, Patricia Callahan, Josh Flurkey, Tabor Tesmer, Lucas Ethan. Be with these situations in the world. We think of Israel and... <clears throat> In Ukraine, just bless and watch over those situations. And as we go forward, let us go forward in that peace that you give us by grace through faith in Jesus the Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took bread after supper. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and drink. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is given to you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. We pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the 
And now may this true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you and keep you in the one true faith. To life everlasting, depart in peace. Amen. Jesus Christ, watch over you, bless you, and keep you. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. You may be seated, and we continue with Blessed Assurance 426.
study back here for the next six months or so, but it's, it's, a, it's a video series on the Holy Land and the different stories and the challenges that, you know, faith faces. Um, uh, you know, give some thought to joining us. Um, you know, I think it's very interesting, but also call your attention to the announcements. Um, I'm just going to read it. Uh, please give thought to joining us this coming Thursday night here. Um, it's just our, our, our group, so to speak, but the local ministerial alliance is working on a community-wide prayer evening. The idea is that each congregation will meet in their own building at 7 p.m. The first one will be this Thursday, October 24th. We will meet in the conference room at 7 p.m. Call me if you have any questions. Uh, please give thought to joining us. Blessings to you and yours in Christ. Um, so give that some thought. Uh, please join us for coffee, snacks, fellowship back here. I will see you back here.